he jumped up there and grabbed the M60 like 40 Murphy and just stood up there and blazed away. And uh, the night it happened, we all thought it was a mortar attack. And everybody came over the speakers. Mortars, mortars, we all died. And um, lo and behold, it wasn't a mortar attack. It was just one explosion. Landed, we dug these pits where he slept for that reason. And Burst was in there and he was blowing up in his pit. And he said, so-and-so did it. He knew the guy who did it. Because he'd been at odds with this particular soldier who wanted to go back to Australia. He was under pressure like all of us. We'd had enough, what with, you know, the protest movement and feeling pretty down. Nobody liked the officer verse. He was just too stiff up a lip. He couldn't be one of the boys. And in a way, we sort of said, well, good riddance, it's bad luck. But it's terrible for his family, but he's gone. There's a great court case out of it and went on and on for weeks. So um, that was a cloud over the battery. But after that, we started wearing hand grenade pins around our neck. And we thought it was pretty cool to show them that we were boss of them. Don't step out of line, you might bloody get your head knocked off. Of course, it wouldn't be that bad to our own men, would be. The Monash University students at that time were sort of heavily involved in anti-war demonstrations and uh, even to the point of financing or sending finance to the North Vietnamese and uh, this hurt a, a lot of us. They probably led the moratoriums. Uh, the moratoriums in itself stopped the war or stopped Australia's involvement in the war and that was probably a good thing. That was the end of the war but uh, not to have your own people um, sending aid to the other side, uh, that's wrong. They seem to have an angle of supporting the North Vietnamese in their struggles against the South and us. And that's what really got us uptight. Because we then we had the next thing, the unions started to protest by stopping the, the loading of our ammunition and our beer and our goods that we needed, the waterside workers particularly. And then they started stopping our mail. And we got really angry then. And we started a campaign of punch a poster when we got back. A wallop a wharfie. It really left a nasty taste in our mouth when we thought of these people at home relaxing and having the luxury of being able to protest. Not that they shouldn't be able to, but it seemed very one-sided and we didn't approve of that because, you know, we could have got killed over there whether we liked it or not. We were there. And uh, most of us had accepted the situation and uh, were more than happy to finish our time. It just made us feel ashamed in the end of some of the things we were, we were purported to be doing, which, you know, were taking action in the war we were, had to fight people who were not really known to us but they were enemy and we didn't appreciate people at home not supporting us but uh, that's their right in a de democracy so we were we got over it eventually well I, I, I was annoyed with the all those protesters because i thought now those boys are over there doing what they think is the right thing and here they are back home they're safe and protesting about something that they can't do much about. And I was very annoyed about that. But I think perhaps now, if I were young again, and it was the time again, I might feel differently about Peter going to the war. Tet Offensive, we probably at that stage didn't realise um, how significant or important it was. Um, we went by uh, road uh, north of uh, Saigon and we moved probably three or four times. Um, and I know on at least two or three of those moves, each time that we moved and were replaced by another battery, uh, that they uh, were hit. Um, I think at one stage there there's something like 14 or 15 uh, batteries and mortar uh, platoons um, engaged and we were the only ones that weren't uh, hit during that time. 
Um, again, uh, we were replaced by a Kiwi battery. Um, we had uh, oh, only a matter of weeks before we went home. And you now the Kiwis were hit after we moved out. So, I mean, we just, we were just led a very charmed life. We were very, very lucky. Um, again, when we went back uh, to Newry Dap and had to do some perimeter work there, um, there was, uh, I think there was um, some form of contact, but uh, again, it wasn't in our area. So we were very lucky. Everybody looks, looks forward to the day they go home. Uh, you, you have this uh, number of days and a wakey, so whether it be 36 or 15 or 10 or whatever, it's, um, it's the wakey that counts, so that was the day you went home. And knowing that we couldn't sleep, we thought we'd all sit up and play cards. And uh, so we did this, and about two o'clock in the morning, uh, we heard some um, rifle machine gun fire out on the perimeter, and the tannoy, the, the speaker, is always open in case we have a fire mission. And in the background, we heard somebody say, did I understand you to say two rows are being overrun? Well, if you can imagine 12, 14, 15 guys sitting in a room a matter of hours before we came home, everybody just sat there, dumbfounded. We just, nobody spoke. We, we just couldn't believe what we'd heard. And then, of course, uh, we heard this laughing in the background, but... It was probably the most frightening thing that happened to us in 12 months. It was just unbelievable. We landed at Essen Airport and the exhilaration was incredible. There we saw all our family and it was particularly good for a, a, a guy in our age group to see your mother for some reason. You know, more important than a girlfriend or anything because you really miss your mother because you're still fairly young when you went off to that thing and it was um, a fairly emotional time for everybody. And you could tell the relief on her. It looks like she just had years lifted off her life because naturally they were worried the whole time we were over there because it was a television war, you know, it was reported. And they always saw the worst side of it on TV at night. And Rowan's mother was there, very excited. We were both very excited. And then finally when the plane came and Peter's, the boys were there, you know, we just rushed over to <laughs> and hugged them. And it was so wonderful to have him back home again, safe and sound. Nothing had changed in two years. I mean, maybe I'd changed a little bit, I don't know, but it just, to me, it, it, it was like a time warp. Everything had just stopped dead. And um, same people, same place, doing the same things. It just, it was crazy. And just walking uh, back into Melbourne was just a funny feeling. Back into my house. I thought there'd be people out in the street waiting for me, waving me back into the home, but they weren't there. I just didn't seem to fit in. And that's, uh, you know, you start ringing up your, you know, your mates you're in the army with. Well, I missed the comradeship of the other lads I'd been with who I'd served with because they were kept, they replaced family and were like family too. Arranging our own little groups again, you know, the, 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 the guys we'd been away with. And uh, one seemed more compatible with those. We just seemed to, to be on the same wavelength. But we kept meeting and meeting because we couldn't let go of each other for some reason. It took us about 12 months, I reckon, before we let go of the mateship. And then we um, went on our merry way back to working. And then a few years later, a lot of us just felt the need again to get together and it started again. It's just a great friendship. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, Thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Saviour. <laughs>